Hi, hello, welcome to the second lecture in the path of managerial economics and economic policy. I remind you that I am running like uh, two different courses or two different subjects uh, in like the same path of teaching uh, with the major uh, management I run a class called managerial economics and with the majors international business and international relations and cultural diplomacy I run a course at the third year called uh, economic policy they are very they are very similar uh, they both boil down to learning how to predict more or less uh, reliably or more or less confidently, like the next move of governments uh, in terms of policies affecting business and economy. So here we go into the second lecture in that path of teaching. And in the lecture, I want to open up uh, on like two things. First of all, I want to open up on uh, a general path of research which for this semester, this winter semester 2020-2021, I suggest to all my students in those, uh, uh, in those two courses, in those two majors. And secondly, I open up on like the basics of politics or basics of political systems. Here one preliminary remark as for this like knowledge about political systems. Students of the major management had in the first year a course uh, entitled World Political Systems. And uh, incidentally, I was giving those lectures on political systems. So I assume that students in the major management, students who uh, have now with me the course of managerial economics, can use uh, the, uh, those pieces of content about political systems as a revision. But I assume that you guys from management, you essentially know what I am talking about when I am talking about political power, forms of political power, structure of political power. Uh, on the other hand, students of the third year uh, in those majors international relations uh, you might be less familiar with my nomenclature and with my general drift as regards the political system. So I strongly encourage you uh, to get familiar with that content, which I will be suggesting like a few slides later in this video. So let's go. Let's waltz. My intention this semester is to like take the bull by the horns and focus on the thing which is important for all of us. It is a path of research about economic recovery through and after the pandemic of COVID-19. I think that many of you have already experienced or maybe you know someone who has directly experienced uh, that adverse economic impact of the pandemic. By the way, that impact is not necessarily adverse. For example, I can admit quite straightforwardly that I made a ton of money in the stock market precisely on the stock of companies which gained great, uh, greatly in value uh, during the pandemic. For example, the biotechs I made uh, there was one Polish biotech which I made like 400% on, a gain of 400% uh, like within six weeks. Okay, let's go into the subject matter. So, the general take is the following. COVID-19 has hit and keeps hitting economies. So, what is the most likely next move in public policies? Uh, so, the general path of research which I propose is the role of public policies in economic recovery through and possibly after the pandemic of COVID-19. Uh, we can see that lockdowns without such uh, policy of recovery can be deadly for local economies. 
California is a great example now. Of course, if you want in your individual projects to graduate those courses, so to graduate economic policy or to graduate managerial economics, you can follow a different path. You can choose a topic of your own, whatever you choose as a topic. And as long as you stay on the general track of interaction between public policies and business, I will tutor you. No problem. And what I am developing here in this presentation is just like a good suggestion, which I think has the advantage of being close to real life. Now, in terms of theory, uh, in terms of theory of economic policy, uh, that context, so the context of economic recovery during and after the pandemic, can be found in textbooks under uh, the general heading of expansionary economic policy. Not all economic policies are expansionary, but right now we have ones which are supposed, which have to be expansionary. So the first question here, maybe I would make that slide slightly bigger. Okay, to fit nicely in the margins. So the question is, what specifically are governments reacting to when they devise those policies of recovery? Uh, it seems that the uh, recession related to pandemic is a combination of two things or two distinct economic phenomena. On the one hand, we have something called the classical Keynesian spiral or a Keynesian recession. Uh, businesses collapse, for example, hairdressing salon. Uh, businesses collapse, which causes unemployment. Unemployment makes the final demand for goods and services shrink. So further businesses collapse. And so we, we have like a downward spiral. That's what we call a Keynesian recession. Uh, but that superimposes or combines with something else, with a quick technological change and uh, a capital shift or shift of investment between different industries in the context of that quick technological change. We have a change in the energy base because we are quite quickly transitioning from fossil fuels to renewable energies. And we have like a rebirth, like a renewal uh, of interest in the nuclear. We have like a new generation of nuclear power plants called the modular power plants. It is like small stuff. Uh, so that's one thing. Another thing is the general imperative to adapt our technologies to climate change. For example, our infrastructures, our farming technologies. We have the development of digital technologies. Uh, if you know how much more Zoom or MS Teams we are using now, you know what I am talking about. And finally, due to the pandemic or in relation with the pandemic, we have a change in the pharmaceutical industry and in biotechnologies. So in that context, I propose you to see governments as movers of capital and as the mediators of institutional change. From the point of view of economic policy or managerial economics, this is, these are the two big things that governments can do. They can move capital around quite quickly and they can mediate institutional change. And in that, con and in that context, we ask three essential questions. When we say government or governments, what exact type of social entity do we mean? Uh, secondly, what can governments do which other uh, social entities cannot do or can do in a less efficient way? So what is like the, the advantage of governments doing something about business? And finally, what kind of powers and benefits can political players attempt to secure at the expense of other social entities. Yes, in a perfect world, uh, we should expect that the go that governments just contribute to economic recovery, 
uh, without any opportunistic game or an opportunistic play in political actors. Yet, in the real world that we live in, there is a lot of such uh, foul play in the politics when a crisis comes. Almost every economic crisis and every recovery policy known in recent economic history was connected to such like shifts and private interests being, uh, being secured. Okay. Now, I introduce the first thing, so the question what exact type of social entity do we mean uh, when we say government? Uh, I will do a little bit of reading from Niccolo Machiavelli here. I hope that the text is visible in the, uh, in the, uh, in the window. And uh, I introduce Machiavelli to illustrate uh, one of the big principles of political power and political governments. Once again, this is the moment when uh, I present content supposedly new for the students of economic policy and content which is just revision from the first year for the students of major management. So, here comes the quote from Machiavelli. The principalities of which one has record are found to be governed in two different ways, either by a prince with a body of servants, who assist him to govern the kingdom as ministers by his favor and permission, or by a prince and barons who hold the dignity by antiquity of blood and not by the grace of the prince. Such barons have states and their own subjects who recognize them as lords and hold them in natural affection. Those states are, that are governed by a prince and his servants hold their prince in more consideration, because in all the country there is no one who is recognized as superior to him. And if they yield obedience to another, uh, they do it as to a minister and official, and they do not bear him any particular affection. The examples of these two governments in our time are the Turk and the King of France. The entire monarchy of the Turk is governed by one lord, the others are his servants, and, dividing his kingdom into sanjaks, he sends their different administrators and shifts and changes them as he chooses. But the King of France is placed in the midst of an ancient body of lords, acknowledged by their own subjects and beloved by them. They have their own prerogatives, nor can the King take these away except at his peril. Uh, now, just a quick digression, a historical one. Uh, that book by Niccolo Machiavelli, the book entitled The Prince, was published in 1532. It was before the Bourbon dynasty uh, in France started really to mean business about the absolute monarchy. Absolute monarchy is a matter of the next century. Here we are talking about the, like the classical feudal order. Anyway, this quote introduces an important distinction when we want to understand political systems and especially the role of politicians for economic policies. It is that governments can display various degrees of concentration or dispersion in political power. Uh, and that relative concentration and dispersion matters for economic policies and for the outcomes of those policies for the real ways of doing business. Generally, we can say that the more dispersed is political power in a country, so the more different uh, actors, the more different centers of political power are there in the national political system, the more capital is that political system moving around by various means. It essentially boils down to the fact that if you, if in politics, you want to have like real power, not just uh, uh, declarative power, but, but if you want to have real impact on other people, you need money, you need a capital base. And so the more different centers of political power you have in a country, so the more dispersed is a political system, the more capital all those guys and girls are moving around. 
and that gives them relatively greater a leverage on business and economy. Conversely, political systems which display strongly concentrated political power, like with few distinct centers of that power, they have comparatively smaller a capital base and their direct impact on the economy is relatively weaker. Now, one important distinction it is to understand right now. Coercive power that governments have, so the capacity to use force, the capacity to put someone in jail, the capacity to confiscate someone's money, it is different from the actual impact on business and economy. As a matter of fact, as I will develop on in a, in a moment, coercive power has very little utility in uh, trying to influence business and economy. Now, uh, these, the two slides that follow are specifically uh, addressed to the students of international relations who didn't have those classes about political systems with me. So here I just make you, I just let you know that in the presentation which goes together with this lecture, you, you can find links to my lectures on political systems, to my lectures which I placed on YouTube and on my blog. So here is the political systems number one. Uh, it is the lecture which opens on political systems and opens on the basic distinctions. Just uh, for you to know, I give here the two cases, the Constitution of Uganda and the Constitution of India, as well as two like classical scientific papers about political systems. And there are a few other lectures, which I all placed online. You can see those links here. Uh, essentially, these are lectures about the forms of political power and about electoral regimes, especially those, uh, those lectures. So the first two bullet pointed lectures about the forms of political power are important to understand the, uh, let's say, the ways that the governments can generally impact the economy and the business that goes on in their national economies. Now, I progressively open up on the second question, which I asked in the beginning, which is what can governments do which other social entities cannot do or can do in a less efficient way? Generally, we can assume that governments are great at certain things, sort of acceptably efficient at doing other things, and they completely suck at a certain category of policies or actions related to business and economy. So I start by the end. So I start by uh, outlining very clearly where is the boundary of uh, the capacity that any government has in impacting their economy. Governments utterly suck at developing new markets and technologies from the stage of acquired science to that of working functional structures. Governments just don't have the entrepreneurial nerve that is required to transform science into actual markets and actual working technologies. They can't do it. I was born and raised in a communist country. I am very well placed to know that, it, that this stuff just doesn't work with the government. Now, governments are acceptably efficient when they are to carry out or finance long-term basic scientific research and maintaining social cohesion around that scientific research, which is important in the context of technological change that we are going through right now. And governments at good, uh, let's say, at uh, um, mastering some private involvement for such projects. Uh, now, governments are really good, are really great at quickly moving around the large amounts of capital. So, for example, when you want to build railroads 
uh, or when you want to have like a quick recovery plan, quick injection of cash into the economy, like now, uh, through the pandemic of COVID-19, governments are really good at it. Hmm? Of course, they can benefit from attracting private uh, actors into the game, yet they are really good at it. And finally, the another quote from Machiavelli. Uh, by the way, I hope you can excuse me, but I really like Machiavelli. Uh, I think that he had like those deep insights into the way that states and political systems work. So here is a quote which illustrates or sort of co-informs that the distinction between coercive power that the governments have and the actual impact on business and economy that they can have. Here it goes. Nevertheless, a prince ought to inspire fear in such a way that if he does not win love, he avoids hatred. Because he can endure very well being feared whilst he is not hated, which will always be as long as he abstains from the property of his citizens and subjects and from their women. But when it is necessary for him to proceed against the life of someone, he must do it on proper justification and for a manifest cause. But above all things, he must keep his hands off the property of others, because men more quickly forget the death of their father than the loss of their patrimony. Besides, the pretexts for taking away the property uh, are never wanting, for he who has once begun to live by robbery will always find pretexts for seizing what belongs to others. But reasons for taking life, on the contrary, are more difficult to find and sooner lapse. But when a prince is with his army and has under control a multitude of soldiers, then it is quite necessary for him to disregard the reputation of cruelty, for without it he would never told he would never hold his army united or disposed to his to its duties. Okay, guys. So that would be all in that second lecture uh, in the stream of managerial economics and economic policy. I hope it is interesting. I will put online subsequent lectures in this path of research. Try to think about your projects as I outlined it in the first lecture, in the opening lecture in that path. And generally have fun with science and have fun with life. Bye.